If you study wartime engineering manuals or, you know, read sapper memoirs from the Second World War, one detail keeps surfacing in places where it really shouldn't. Troops describe cooking, warming their hands, even boiling water in forward areas without giving away their position. No drifting smoke column. No acrid haze clinging to the ground at dawn. For men trained to demolish bridges and clear minefields, fire was not a comfort tool, but honestly a liability, and yet sappers learned how to tame it. What they developed was not a gadget, but a method. It was quiet, disciplined, and brutally effective, and it remains one of the most useful pieces of backyard and field wisdom ever passed down from wartime experience. By feeding oxygen directly to the base of the fire, sappers forced hotter, cleaner combustion. Flames stayed small, heat stayed concentrated, and smoke all but disappeared. From a distance, there was nothing to see. Fuel selection was the second half of the method. Sappers were trained never to burn green wood unless there was no alternative. Fresh wood is full of moisture and resins that create thick smoke. Instead, they split dead wood into small pieces and dried it aggressively, sometimes near the body or inside clothing during movement. Small, dry fuel burns hotter and faster, producing less smoke and more usable heat. Fire layout mattered just as much as fuel. Rather than piling wood haphazardly, sappers built fires vertically, thin kindling at the bottom, slightly thicker pieces above, and fuel added gradually. This top-fed approach prevented sudden smothering of the flame, which is a major cause of smoke. It also allowed constant adjustment. If smoke appeared, fuel was reduced, not increased. Wind was never fought directly. Instead, it was shaped. The air intake pit was positioned to catch prevailing wind and channel it underground. This stabilized the fire even in gusty conditions and prevented smoke from being blown sideways. Above ground, the fire pit itself remained shielded by earth, which absorbed light and reflected heat inward. Cooking was done with patience. Mess tins were suspended over the pit or placed on narrow supports so they never blocked airflow. Blocking the fire is another common cause of smoke. Sappers understood that cooking slowly was safer than cooking fast. A meal that took longer but stayed invisible was always the better choice. So, applying this knowledge in a modern backyard, or, you know, a survival situation, is actually pretty straightforward, if you just follow the same principles. Right? The first step is digging with intention. A narrow, deep fire pit paired with a smaller air intake hole makes a dramatic difference compared to open fires. Even shallow soil works, honestly, if the pit walls are reinforced with stones or, well, compacted earth. So, the second step is ruthless fuel discipline. You want to use dry, split wood, no thicker than your wrist. And, oh, make sure to avoid bark-heavy pieces and anything that's damp. If you see smoke appearing, remove some fuel rather than adding more. Remember, fire should be fed, not smothered. 
Now, the third step is airflow awareness. Always give the fire a clear oxygen path from below. All right? The fourth step is scale. A sapper fire was never large. It was built only as big as needed and no larger. Excess fire produces excess smoke. Control came from restraint, not force. What makes this technique enduring is that it relies on physics, not technology. It works with wood, soil and patience. It does not depend on modern stoves, fuels or accessories. That is why it worked under fire in World War II and why it still works today. This is not romantic campfire lore. It is applied wartime engineering adapted for survival and discretion. If you value hard-earned historical knowledge that still performs under real conditions, this channel is built for you. Subscribe to Backyard Wisdom for more deep, practical history. And share this episode with anyone who believes a fire has to announce itself to be useful.